Hello, thank you everyone for uh, joining us from the comfort of your uh, of your homes. Um, I'm here today with Gary Young and Jagjit Chada from the National Institute of Economic and Social Research. We'll be talking about uh, their assessment of the economic impact of the coronavirus, drawing on some research that they've been conducting over the past couple of weeks. Um, and uh, just to introduce our two speakers, Jagjit is uh, the director of the National Institute of Economic and Social Research, and Gary Young is the director of macroeconomic modeling and forecasting at the National Institute. We're very pleased to be joined by them for this uh, for this webinar. That's part of a, a kind of ongoing cooperation between UNICEF and the, the National Institute in areas of common uh, strategic interest. Uh, there's sort of a natural link between uh, the National Institute's strengths in uh, macro modeling and policy analysis and, and UNPIF's focus on the OI sector and kind of global policy and investment themes related to that. Um, just before we start with uh, Gary's presentation, a few housekeeping notes. This presentation and this webinar as a whole uh, are on the record and are being recorded. Um, and audience members can ask questions either via typing them into the little chat box uh, that shows up in the GoToWebinar app. Uh, so there should be a little drop down chat panel or alternatively uh, by emailing them to enquiries at onfif.org. So it's <laughs> enquiries at onfif.org. And please do state your name and organization if and when you send in a question. Um, so with that being said, um, I think we'll start with Gary's presentation. Uh, the slides are being displayed right now. And um, yeah, go ahead. Over to you, Gary. Thank you very much, Pierre, and good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to South London, where I'm sitting. Um, and what we're talking about today is assessing the economic impact of the coronavirus. And the um, the title is deliberate and it's not really a finished assessment but it's how we go about making an assessment of the economic impact of the virus um, as we all know there's been a tragic loss of life um, and the global economy is being hit by this ongoing health shock and this chart which is from the financial times which has been a great source of tracking the developments of the coronavirus shows the position as it was in the paper this morning. And what we are focusing on is the economic effects. And we know a bit about this so far from what's happened to market prices and various other indicators. So we know that equity markets are down, although they've started to recover a bit in recent days. So the FTSE is almost 25% lower than it was a year ago. There have been a whole range of fiscal support measures announced in many countries. Um, at the same time, corporate risk is up. So we've seen CDS, credit default swap premiums increasing and corporate bond spreads up. Um, so we know that the corporate sector has, or parts of the corporate sector have a lot of debt. And so the, um, with a highly leveraged corporate sector, then a shock has a big effect on equity prices. And that's what we've seen. And we've seen risk rising. There's been a big monetary policy stimulus in a lot of countries. So in the UK, for example, a 10-year gilt yield is now below 1%. And partly um, to do with other things, but the oil price is also down. So it's now down to about $34 a barrel. And we've started to see the impact in the surveys of businesses. So the PMIs for March are down to record low levels. And we shudder to think what the PMIs are going to look like for April. Same time as other changes going on. So electricity consumption, for example, is down by 25% in Italy. We've seen road travel in the UK down by 73%. We've seen schools and universities being closed. And then this chart was quite a shocker um, that came out last week in terms of the new weekly claims for unemployment benefits in the United States. So you, you, it just looks like a vertical increase to six and a half million claims the weekend in um, March the 28th. And you can't even really see on the chart the reading from the week before of three and 
over 3 million claims in the week ending March the 21st. So it's quite an astonishing chart when you put that in the context of the um, financial crisis a few years ago, which hardly looks like a, a blip on there now. So there's quite a lot we can see happening in terms of the economic effects of the coronavirus um, pandemic, but there's massive uncertainty about the economic effects. And so I think it, you know we don't necessarily want to put a number on on things yet. We don't know how the virus is, what course the virus is going to take. There are some promising signs now of um, lockdowns being effective in in reducing the um, the spread of the virus, but we can't be certain about that. We don't know yet what impact this is having on health and the ability of people to work. We don't know how long the lockdowns are going to last. So in the UK. Um, I think it's only been about two weeks that we've been locked down um, and there's no real sense of how long this is going to last or what the exit strategy is going to be like. We don't know how long governments will be able to provide the support they've provided. Um, these are very costly support measures and if the crisis goes on for more than um, the three months that a lot of governments have sort of factored in, then it could be very expensive and you may see some rolling back of um, some of the measures. We don't know whether businesses will survive, so we don't know whether there'll be sort of long term effects of, a rel of what could be a relatively short term shock in terms of businesses just not being around much longer. And we can imagine that it could be quite big hysteresis effect effects in the labour market when job matches are broken. So there's massive uncertainty about the economic effects of the crisis. Um, and the consequence of that is that there's little agreement among forecasters about the effects. So this chart is taken from Focus Economics, who have been doing a weekly update on, um, on what forecasters are saying. And you can see in the left, top left-hand chart, questions about what will be the negative impact on COVID-19 on 2020 global growth in percentage points. And um, you can see that there's an increasing, or, or there are quite a high proportion of forecasters who think that the hit will be of more than four percentage points to growth, but there is no sort of obvious consensus on that. Um, in terms of the shape of the global economic downturn, the, the chart in the bottom left-hand corner, you can see a lot of different views on whether it's going to be a V-shape, U-shape, W-shape, or whatever. In the top right-hand corner, whether it's going to have a negative impact beyond 2020. Two thirds say yes, um, a third say no. And how many quarters will the recession last? Majority say in two quarters, but um, quite a large number of people think it could be longer than that. So there's a lot of um, uncertainty and there's a lot of disagreement. I mean, I don't think it's, it's disagreement, it's just that people don't really know. Hence the question is what's the most sensible thing to do in those circumstances? And I think one thing you can do is think about the channels by which it might have an impact. So this um, chart looks at some of the, the channels that you might think about the coronavirus affecting the global economy. Firstly, there's a supply shock that comes about because people um, work in fewer hours. They're not able to supply labor because they're ill. And that will obviously have some impact on productivity as well, because you have key people missing in organizations and so other people can't just slot in and do their work for them. Um, it will have an effect on consumer spending and investment, a simple demand shock because of the greater uncertainty there is about how long the shock is going to last. And there will be spillovers of the impact of the shock from other countries. So even if your country doesn't have much of a direct impact on, on the health of your, your people, there will be spillovers from the fact that other countries um, are demanding less of your products. There's lower confidence and risk appetite, which is affecting asset prices and, um, and corporate bond yields. So that's like an asset demand shock. Then, of course, there's what we're going through at the moment, deliberate reduction in economic activity due to the lockdowns, which is just designed to stop um, the, the virus spreading. So we're using the economy really is an instrument to prevent the virus spreading further. Then the last channel is through the policy measures to mitigate the impact of the shock. And what we've done at the National Institute is to try and model some of these things. And this is work we did a couple of weeks ago, and it's already out of date. 
but I think it's just, you know, what we're really talking about here is some of the ways in which we can think about modeling these effects. So we took, we made an assumption about the infection, the rate of infection and how long people were affected by that. And we made an assumption about, as a consequence of that, labor supply and productivity being lower. We made an assumption about desired consumer spending being down by 10% for one quarter. And that 10% came from a consideration of um, how much sort of non-essential spending there is in different countries and um, making an assumption about what proportion of that might be lost. Um, in our model, the NIGEM, the National Institute of Global Econometric Model, is a, we have a global model where you, you automatically get amplification across countries. So if, if a shock happens somewhere, that will feed into other countries as well. We assumed that investment premia would be raised by about 300 basis points for three quarters. This is based on the sort of size of the premium that um, we observed in a global financial crisis. We assumed that the shutdowns would reduce demand and output by about 6% for one quarter. And we assumed that monetary policy would respond in a sort of normal way, according to the effect of the shock on GDP and inflation. And then this is how the some of the numbers that we get out of doing that analysis. And as I say, this analysis is already out of date, um, but you can see the um, impact on GDP that we are getting in the first year of the shock. So in the US, we're getting GDP about 5% lower than, it, than in, in our previous forecast, um, and with similar um, sort of numbers in different countries. And we've broken that shock down there into the part which is due to our assumption about the lockdown which i think is now much too small but nevertheless that's what the assumption that we we made in in putting these slides together and um you can see the effect excluding lockdown that's the first year effect and then this chart shows the effect in first year and in the second year so you can see that in most countries on this basis um, we have GDP lower in 2020, but not much lower in 2021. So that would imply quite a sharp increase in the growth rate because we, we'd be going back quite quickly to the level we would have been at otherwise, according to this um, simulation. So you have a big negative growth rate in 2020 and then a big positive growth rate in 2021 to get you back to roughly the level you would otherwise have been at the end of 2021, according to this simulation. Now, of course, I'm anticipating questions from the audience on whether this is realistic or not. And I think that's the way we need to think about this, whether these assumptions are realistic, or what reasons there might be for um, there being more persistent impact of these shocks. Now, there's just um, in terms of how to think about how monetary policy ought to respond to the shock, you could think about the, the there being a big supply shock. So in other words, the if this is an ISLM type diagram, you can imagine that the sort of equilibrium level of output shifts inwards from Y star to Y double star. So you get a shift in the sort of flexible price level of output the economy could sustain. And if there was no shift in the um, IS curve, that would lead policymakers to want to put interest rates up. But because of the shift in demand that you're going to get alongside this change, you would expect the IS curve to shift downwards as well. And so generally, um, we've seen central banks cut interest rates in reaction to the shock, but it's too early to judge at the moment really whether that's the appropriate response to the shock that we've had or, or not. And in terms of the simulation effects, so we have these effects on interest rates running through the model. So interest rates cut, US and China and the UK have obviously not cut very much in the euro area because there isn't really any scope to have done so. So just to summarize then the what we've the analysis that we've done so far, the early analysis pointed to a loss of output at least as big as in the um, great financial crisis back in 2007-8-9. But those shocks already seem too small. And I think um, there's been quite a lot of discussion recently about the effect of the lockdowns on UK GDP and you know, most 
or a lot of reputable forecasters are now expecting GDP to be reduced by about 20% in Q2, assuming that the lockdown continues for that period. But as I said earlier, we really don't know how long the lockdown is going to last or whether it might continue into Q3 as well. So obviously we can update that as new information becomes available. The analysis also you know, provides global input um, for more detailed country models. So you know, I know a lot of individual countries want to know what's happening in the rest of the world so they can put that into their model. Um, and that's useful for that. But I think the next steps in our analysis definitely involve assessing the role of the fiscal measures that have been taken, the possibility of hysteresis effects, which make the shock more persistent, and the consideration of the, uh, the exit strategy. Um, our full analysis of the effects on the global economy and our forecast will be published on the 29th of April in about three weeks' time. And that will be available free from um, Cambridge University Press. And then if you're interested in more details on NIGEM, they're available on our website, or you can conduct or contact Ian Hurst at the Institute if you would like a trial how the model works. So that was all I wanted to say by way of um, sort of introduction to the discussion. Um, over to you, Pierre. Thanks, Gary. Um, I'll just start off with a few questions from myself. Uh, that are sort of broadly addressed to uh, yourself and to Jagjit. Um, and then once we've sort of covered a few of those, I'll address some audience questions. Just a, a gentle reminder to any viewers to send any interesting questions you might have uh, into either the inquiries email address that I mentioned or into the little chat box. Um, so I, I wanted to start with a question about um, hysteresis effects. I know you kind of touched on the fact that you are sort of in the in the early stages of thinking about this at the moment, but I think it's an underappreciated part of the labor market impact of the shock. Um, given the high unemployment numbers, it's unlikely that people will sort of find the same job that they had before the shock again. So you lose a lot of institutional knowledge and acquired sort of fairly specialist skills. And so that has an impact on productivity as well in the long run. What's your early initial assessment of, of those effects? Well, I think the, the assessment depends on how, how long it goes on for. I mean, the reason you get um, hysteresis effects in the labor market is people lose their attachment to labor market by being unemployed for a long time. So at the moment, um, you know, if, the, if the crisis doesn't last very long, then the people won't be unemployed for very long. They won't be out of the labour market, and so they'll, they'll continue to search and do the job of pushing down on wage pressure and bidding themselves back into work. I mean, as I say, I think the, the problem is comes about really when people are unemployed for a long time and then sort of give up on the idea of work. So it really just depends on how long it's going to last for. Um, let's, uh, let's talk about the, uh, the policy response a little bit as well. Um, so you, you mentioned the, uh, the rate cuts on one of, one of your slides had a sort of a nice chart of, of interest rates. I assume that's kind of a, a, a model of the natural rate. Um, what's been your, your assessment of central bank responses so far? I mean, I mean, I think you know, maybe let's focus on the UK mainly, but but you can also cover other central banks sort of at, at your desire, um, including sort of the more unconventional tools. Jack, do you want to jump in on this one? Um, so, so the question is the, the, the monetary policy, additional monetary policy responses that we're seeing. Yeah. Um, I, I think there's a range um, available um, to monetary policy makers. The, the first point to really underline Gary's analysis and that of the team is that we're treating this in the first instance as a, as a temporary shock. So the questions about hysteresis and productivity, although very important, are ones that in our first cut we're thinking are not the first set of problems. And with the temporary shock in place, what we're really seeing is that this, this common shock to health, and as Gary said, the use of the economy as an instrument to limit the common shock, is, uh, is 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 imposing um, 
a, a cost on business that they can't insure themselves against. It's not what's going on right now is not the fault of the private sector or businesses or banks. What we're trying to do is limit the health impacts on the economy, uh, uh, on, on, on people, the tragic loss of life, and then try to use the economy as a way of insulating people from that impact. So because the impact on the economy is not something that is in any way a result of moral hazard or overspending or overinvestment, there's a first order case for fiscal policy authorities to do whatever they can, and many of them are doing whatever they can to offset the size of the shock. And what that means is that economies that are able to should be issuing whatever fiscal support that they can to be targeted at those sectors of the economy and those people who are suffering income losses that are in no way their particular fault. The responsibility of the central banks then is to support that where it can. And what we have are measures uh, of, uh, in terms of expanding the purchases of, of assets by central banks where, where possible, thinking more actively about negative interest rates where it is feasible, um, providing support for the banking sector which may suffer from the imposition of negative interest rates, as well as providing clearer forward guidance. Will central banks be willing to commit interest rates to stay low for a very long time in order to create a boom? It's not something that was done particularly effectively, it seemed to me, 10 or so years ago. But these might be the times to be thinking about more of those so-called open mouth operations. Um, and ultimately, a step on from just buying bonds or corporate bonds or supporting those markets. As Gary said, the corporate bond market is particularly sensitive right now because of the level of leverage that we see out there. That's one set of issues. But central banks might want to go further, as we've seen from the Bank of Japan, and go directly to yield, yield curve control, setting an idea about where long-term interest rates will be and offering to buy assets up to that cap in interest rates. All of these things central banks should be considering for the duration of this crisis, pinning it exactly to the risk that the private sector has suffered through no particular fault of its own. And therefore, it's a time limited and state dependent limited set of responses to this urgent and, and escalating and terribly worrying uh, crisis of hitting the world economy. And that's where central banks, I think, need to be moving towards. And of course, many of them are. I don't think anything I've said is outside of the orthodoxy in, in terms of what central banks are doing. You mentioned the, the fiscal measures about how they should be both as as expansive as possible, uh, sort of doing whatever it takes, mm. um, but then also fairly specific and highly targeted to uh, those that sort of are most in need of, of fiscal support. Um, what's been your assessment of uh, fiscal measures ability to dampen the worst of the shock so far. Uh, I'm thinking specifically of kind of UK policy measures. Have those been sufficient and at the same time broad based enough to really sort of prevent the worst of the of the shock? Well, I think as, as Gary was making out, we're, we're, we're slowly beginning to understand the extent and depth of the shock has happened. So the measures that we saw a couple of weeks ago in the budget looked reasonable then um, and may well have been dealing with our perception of the depth of the shock at that time. As time goes on, and particularly the more that we start to use the economy as the buffer against the further spread of this illness, there may be need for more types of support. So we've, re we've questioned again the extent of um, support for firms in terms of working capital or loans. And we need to think again about how to roll out uh, universal credit quickly to people who need it. And there may be worlds in which we can have a better conversation with banks as to how they can offer uh, short term loans to people as well as firms in order to deal with the shocks that they're facing. Um, I think there are a number of things that could be done that I think will be done. But it it's very much depends upon our perception of the size of the shock. We've moved on a lot in the last couple of weeks. Uh, and so policy, I think, has to follow in that direction as fast as it can. Gary, Gary, you mentioned that um, some of the figures on the uh, impact of the shock that you described in your in your presentation are sort of already slightly outdated. Uh, we'll, we'll we'll give you a pass for that. But I'm I'm sort of wondering if you have any sense of 
basically what the order of magnitude of difference is going to be between the forecast you've presented and the ones that we'll end up seeing in the in the longer term. Are we off by sort of one percentage point or, or, or 10? Um, what's, what's your sort of uh, cocktail napkin estimation of, of, the, of the impact of, of the shock? Well, I think in Q2, I mean, we, we had quite a, a small impact in those um, charts I showed for the impact of the lockdown. And I think it's sort of fairly obvious now that the lockdown will be have a lot more of a negative effect than that. So I would be expecting to see something of the order of a 20% reduction in um, UK GDP in the second quarter. Um, just because of the fact that so many people are not able to work properly. And that, that's assuming that the, um, the lockdown continues for most of the quarter. Obviously, if, if it doesn't, then it would be be smaller. But then there's a question about, um, you, you know, but, I mean, it's very unlikely, I think, that we're going to be in a position where we're going to be able to have a clean break from this, you know, in, in the first half of, of this year. And so, you know, people are still going to be very uncertain about when future lockdowns might come. If you're in that position and you're a sort of small business owner, do you, then you know, suppose you've got a pub or a restaurant, do you reopen or do you just stay stay closed? And you know, I imagine a lot of people will stay closed and this will um, prolong, um, you know, e even if even if there is some sort of lifting of the lockdown, it probably won't be very effective in the sense that people will just um, stay in a sort of fa fairly lockdown position for, for a longer period. So, you know, I think that what we what we would see would be a bigger reduction, um, and then I, I guess the worry is then that there won't be a clean exit as we've assumed in the, in those simulations, where you get a swift bounce back. Um, so I think we'll have a prolonged, um, gradual recovery from that. So you'll you'll probably see a long, uh, you know, much weaker GDP figure for the UK as a whole in this year so it won't just be a question of um sharp decline in q2 and then a sort of bounce back in the second half of the year it'd be a sharp decline in q2 and probably little recovery at least for the third quarter and then um as i say i imagine the uncertainty about this will last for quite a long time which will prevent business recovering in a sharp way as well so i think there's going to be a is this is going to be a much longer term effect so more of a more of an L shape than uh, than than anything else, from what I from what I gathered. Um, yeah, yeah, well, uh, something like that. something like that. But I, you know, I, yeah. I guess the question then is, um, you know, what what should policy do about that? You know, if that is if if that is the like most likely outcome. You know, what what should policy do? I mean, the policy at the moment for the UK seems to have been um, you know, to some extent set for. Uh, uh, you know, a short period rather than for a long, for a prolonged period of um, weakness, economic weakness. I, I, I just um, want to add, yeah. I want to add to, to two points to sort of support Gary's view on the persistence of this shock. I think one thing to think about, one is, one thing that might lead to persistence is the extent to which th this terrible virus turns out to be seasonal and comes back in the autumn or indeed next spring. So we may see an echo of whatever we see now later in the year and next year. I, we don't know, it's absolutely clear. But it's clearly one plausible scenario is that what we're seeing now will be echoed to some extent again later in the year. And then the other point is, is that because of the interconnectedness of trade in the world, is even if there's early evidence that suggests that China is, is emerging from the lockdown, it will not go back to full capacity production in the way it would have done because there's not demand from the rest of the world which is also in lockdown so that leads to a persistence of the shock that you wouldn't get as a result of the interconnectedness so there's two aspects of this the extent to which trade linkages mean that countries can't recover in the way they would have done because many of their trading partners are in, in unsynchronized lockdowns and then the second extent to add to that is the extent to which we see this kind of lockdown thing becoming a cycle uh, over the next year or so, uh, both of which I think support a more persistent downward shock to um, the, the V shape that people first had in their mind, I think. 
I think that's a good uh, good point on which to transition to some of the um, the audience questions. Um, so I'm seeing one that's kind of related to that from uh, Theo Bourgeri from the uh, FCA um, about emerging markets, um, especially you know those that perhaps lack strong healthcare infrastructures. Um, mm. What what kind of economic developments do you expect there? And what spillovers, if any, do you see that might happen um, and sort of spillover specifically onto developed uh, and, and European markets? So that's a question from Theo at the FCA. Uh, uh, Gary, do you want to take that one? And then Jagjit, if you have any thoughts. I was going to leave that on to Jagjit, actually. Okay. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Gary. <laughs> I, 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 th I think Gary used the word tragic earlier on today, and I think many aspects of this crisis are tragic and, and one is particularly that this is affecting um, lower income households more they're ones less likely to be able to continue their work and also are likely to affect lower income economies more as well we've had indications from some of our contacts in even middle e middle income countries that uh, their manufacturing sectors are stalled in their own form of lockdown they're very reliant on tourist receipts that have been very badly hit as a result of the, the global lockdown and travel. Um, they uh, also, as, you, as the questioner said, don't have the healthcare support that we have in these countries. So the shock itself is, is more uh, negatively impacting on morbidity than it is in even in the tragic case of, of the UK and the West. And, and furthermore, the economies um, often have um, dollar currency debt and don't have particularly strong domestic mechanisms for uh, issuing domestic debt. So they cannot respond to the shock with the same extent of fiscal armory that we can in the West. So there's a number of things here that mean that they're suffering a, a much worse domestic shock. They've got a much more vulnerable external position, and yet they don't have the domestic tax revenue raising mechanisms or the, the, the fiscal mechanisms to raise the level of debt the UK or the US or other advanced economies can. So I, I think it's incredibly worrying, and it is very much, even though on the first pass, we have a common shock, actually, the more that we do the work, the more we're going to see this as, in fact, a, a shock that affects these countries a lot more. And so we're going to see a lot more work, I think, for the IMF and the World Bank in trying to offset some of the crises we're going to see in these economies. Mm. And then the, the spillovers from that, the, the main channels or sort of trade, as you were talking about, and, and what, what else? Can you kind of walk us through your thinking on that? Well, there's trade. I mean, the, the financial market uh, issues are incredibly interesting. We put a couple of papers out. Uh, we've got a, uh, we're setting up in the early page of setting up our COVID-19 page. So we've got some papers there and we've got colleagues from the Bank for International Settlements uh, and uh, people who used to work in the debt management office trying to understand the, the financial flows. And I think the Fed has done a great job in providing dollar liquidity. The markets are short of dollar liquidity in a particular way. Uh, and that's been helpful there, but at the same time, that makes it uh, quite uh, the dollar is appreciated, and that's made it hard for economies that have lots of dollar denominated debt. Many emerging or middle income countries have, um, as well as making it hard for them to issue domestic currency debt at the moment as well, because there's been this move to uh, away from risk and towards less risky assets. So in that world, it's uh, particularly hard for them. So I, I think you're going to see countries that have relatively low foreign exchange reserves and high levels of uh, dollar denominated debt also mm. having some currency vulnerability. I'm sure people out there are starting with that kind of analysis. It's something that we're trying to understand as well at the moment. But yes, there are well-known uh, measurable factors that drive external uh, balance of payments crises or exchange mm. rate crises. And I think you're going to see this crisis um, feeding off those in a way that we, I think we understand but there's still terribly uh, a terrible set of events for these countries to face. Um, a question from uh, Sebastian de Ramon uh, from the Bank of England. Can you run us through on what drives the longer term negative effect in the NIGEM simulation year three and year four and later? What and what policies could mitigate those long term negative effects? Um, it's very nice to hear from Sebastian, who I know well. Um, and uh, it, I mean, in terms of the, the long run effect in, in the model, we don't really have a significant long run effect on the level of, of GDP. Um, things go back to base quite 
quite well. But I think yeah, the worry is that there will be in, in reality a negative long run effect because of the sort of hysteresis effects that we were talking about earlier, you know, from in the, potentially in the labor market, but also amongst you know, capital ending up being in the wrong places and you know, businesses failing and, you know, and the sort of networks that exist between businesses um, breaking down. So there, I, I think there is sort of longer term risks that are not really, not really captured fully in our model, but they're certainly there in the world. Um, here's a question from Andre at the Russian Trade Mission. Um, do you see any safe havens uh, in this recession for the next sort of quarter or two? So a question about what the potential uh, the potential hiding places for investors are over the next um, couple of next couple of quarters. Um, what what are your thoughts on that? Maybe um, that's one I, I, I mean, to, to be honest, I mean, I I don't really see any obvious safe havens. I mean, the, the, yeah, for the reasons that Jagjit gave earlier, there's a lot of um, sort of unsynchronized. Well, there there is a lot of unsynchronized um, risks around, so that there may be. Um, yeah, so some countries may look like they're doing better for a while. You know, mm. for example, you know, China looks like it's doing a bit better now, ironically. Um, but you know, they they will obviously be relying on trading with customers who won't be doing so well. And so the there is sort of global transmission of of the shock, which probably doesn't leave many obvious safe havens. I don't know if you have got anything to add to that, Jagjit. Not, not really. It's, it's very hard for us to give um, that kind of advice on safe havens. I, I simply yeah. take the point that in a world of, you know, great uncertainty, as as um, Gary uh, uh, outlined, as well as real um, unknown unknowns, really, uh, in a Knightian sense about where we're going to go, it's mm -hmm. very hard to understand what what might be safe in that sense. But clearly, we have seen um, a, a enormous rallies in in many bond markets. But it's very hard to understand whether that is uh, uh, resulting from a shift towards less risky assets or the anticipation of further purchases by government. The, these are things that we've seen time and time again in bond markets since the QE program started. Very hard to understand whether it's risk or whether it's the response to potential future purchases that we're seeing in those markets. Right. Yeah. Uh, but we'll continue to monitor it and we'll think about it more um, if we can. What, um, what I mean, uh, kind of the, the flip side of the, of the safe haven question. Um, what have what have both of you made of kind of the uh, the indefatigable strength of of the dollar over the past couple of weeks and its its uh, the, the sort of trickle through effects of of that onto uh, trade finance and and credit along supply chains is that something that you've been you've been watching closely? Um. Well, I, I I think it's very much uh, just a result of of what we can think of as a dollar liquidity shortage. There's lots of payments to be made in dollars and, and people want to hold on to those dollars in financial markets. Swap lines have been extended by the Federal Reserve um, across the world, which is a very healthy development. Uh, but as of yet, given the movements in the dollars, it's just it's uh, there's still further appetite for holding dollars. Uh, so I think we'll just continue to watch this process. Uh, underpinning that, of course, are increasingly worrying signs of the impact of this on the US economy as well. And we get to see exactly how that will work its way through. Uh, fortunately, we have very high frequent. Well, I don't. Perhaps fortunately is the wrong word, but we, we are able to monitor movements in U.S. employment numbers at the state level at relatively high frequency. So we'll have a very good idea, I think, about some of the impacts on the U.S. economy, uh, which are just as worrying as many other parts. Of the um, here's a question from um, Ryan ida kearney at the dutch central bank i'm very interested in how one should introduce the immediate productivity shock in q2 which follows from the lockdown into nigem so a question about the productivity shock and its its role in, in nigem well i think the product productivity shock is um is a key aspect of this i mean i won't talk about how to introduce it into nigem and perhaps we could do that 
offline, but I think you know there is obviously a negative shock at the moment because of the fact that people are not um, able to work in a in the usual way with other people, and people are missing, and the, and people you know people will be doing other people's jobs, but um, not doing them as well. But there was a question I saw um, on the list of on the chat line a minute ago about the role for startups, where I think you know there is a possibility of there being some silver lining to this, in that you know we've a lot of people have been saying for for a while that product, one of the explanations for the weakness of productivity is because of the survival of zombie firms, um, and I've never really put a lot of weight on that. Um, particular explanation myself but you know to the extent that there have been zombie firms surviving there were well, perhaps one silver lining is that this crisis may get rid of some of those and you know there is obviously a role for startups um, to come along and, and sort of transform economies which have been um, you know suffering from weak productivity for a number of years now so I think you know there is a possibility which you know, as an optimist, I would say you know let's 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 hope that it's that it's a realistic one that um, you know in the longer term there could be some could be some benefits in terms of you know clearing away some of the weaker zombie type firms and putting in place um, more dynamic enterprises that can boost productivity in the longer term. And I think you know, there's generally opportunities for transformation. Not just in terms of productivity, but in, in all sorts of ways that are coming from this. You know, I think um, my experience with video conferencing has made me think I never have to go into work again. Hang um, on a minute. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, um, in terms of you know travel, we can see the impact of you know in London. You look out at night, you can see stars now you couldn't see them before. Mm. So. And that's not just because I've sort of been drinking and fallen over and hit my head, but you know, <laughs> there is there are, there are some sort of um, you know it's obviously a very tragic um, development, but there are some benefits to it that, that may come about in the longer term. Thanks, Gary. You'll you'll have to tell us more about your stargazing uh, experiences uh, later on in the in the webinar. Um, a question on another question on the recovery from uh, Sophie Incourt at the Banque de France uh, on the composition of the recovery, broadly speaking. What, what's kind of your thinking on um, whether it'll be driven by investment uh, or consumer spending and which, which of these kind of drivers will be more important over the course of 2021, 2022 and, and beyond? Um, well, nice to hear from Sophie as well. Um, in terms of the, um, the drivers, my concern is more that there won't be a very sharp recovery because I can see reasons for both um, investment and consumption continuing to be independently weak. Um, you know, so on, on investment, if you have a period where um, you know, of, of great uncertainty, then I can imagine that it will be another excuse for businesses to defer spending again. And on the household side, um, you know, again, there's a lot of uncertainty around, and people will probably think about building up their balance sheet. So, I can see some reasons for, for being fairly pessimistic in the, in the short run on, on those. Jagjit, you probably have a additional answer. No, I, 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 we clearly, I mean, just to go back, I mean, bundling up with the, with the previous question as well about startups and business finance. I think it's something that this may be an opportunity for us to look at again. The, the, the British Business Bank is underpinning the loan guarantees for the firms that are going through a business interruption. And I think the area of SME finance is something that maybe we haven't got right for quite a long time in, in economies. And it could be that if the uncertainty persists in the way that Gary is saying, we might want to think harder about how we get finance to small and medium-sized enterprises that could well be the source of a, of a productivity rebirth when this starts to clear up. So there may be an opportunity there for policy to offset some of the risks by thinking hard about what the business, British Business Bank can do in conjunction with the banking sector and think about the way that provisions are made against the loans that are made with those guarantees to 
actually back some of these ideas uh, more quickly than we have in the past. I think it's been an emergent issue for a while. And it goes it goes back to at least the Rad Radcliffe Committee uh, and others. We haven't really got this right for a very long time in the UK, but this could be an opportunity to address these issues. What's what's that old saying about never letting a a crisis go to waste. So maybe it may be an opportunity to, to rethink uh, business finance. Um, let's just close with uh, one last question from uh, from Leticia Leme. Um, what are your thoughts on monetary financing as a way to finance the UK's debt? Um, and I'd add more broadly the sort of the emergency fiscal packages that have have come about as a result of this uh, exogenous shock. Mm -hmm um and are you concerned that this would kind of lead to uh greater inflation pressure in the long run well um I, I, so, so monetary policy's role um in in this in this particular crisis is to support the fiscal policy choices so the, the, the people running the ministries of finances in the world say look what we need to do is share some of the risk uh, that's being hit, particularly affecting young and people with lower skill levels and those who've got jobs where they can't carry on, unlike those of us lucky enough to be able to continue at home. There's a first order responsibility for the government there to help those people see their way through the crisis. Um, and as, as well as that, potentially to share the risk with future generations. If we can keep as far as possible the economic structures that we've got in place in a form that they can continue once the crisis is over, that's going to be a much better outcome than affecting productivity permanently in a negative manner. And, and that's a risk that we face. And it's something that a number of the people have asked about. So in that world, there is there is every um, every argument for increasing debt levels. So what does monetary policy have to do? It has to support that by ensuring that monetary and financial conditions can bring about the appropriate compensation in aggregate demand so that risk premium don't rise uh, in a particular way and that can be liquidity or credit risk premium or sovereign risk premium so that the level of activity that the, the fiscal policy is trying to bring about actually happens rather than being crowded out by changes in monitoring financial conditions and that's first order the central bank's job we've outlined already a number of things the central bank can do expand its asset purchases facility to different from bonds to corporate bonds as well as be uh, offer clearer forms of forward guidance uh, in terms of, of what it, it, it's trying to do in terms of uh, stabilizing um, the, the economy there and ultimately it can go towards a, a form of yield curve control it can say look, what we're going to do is try and hold long-term interest rates at a particular level that we think are consistent with the level of demand that the fiscal policy authority is trying to eject back into the economy for a very long period in the 1950s interest rates were uh, capped but both in the US and the UK as, as that kind of process went on. Now if all of those things don't work in the way that we want there is potentially a world in which the central bank could think about buying bonds directly from the government so-called monetary financing but that strikes me as a monetary rubicon to, to be thought very hard about whether we do that. That is typically um, in, highly inflationary and not entirely necessary just now so i would rather we went through the more conventional steps and see where we got to i think there is considerable fiscal room i think with the support of the monetary authorities in a state and time dependent manner there's considerable support for aggregate demand depending on how long this crisis goes on other options could be considered <clears throat> yeah uh, i I did a podcast with uh, James Sweeney, who's uh, Credit Suisse's mm. chief economist, uh, a couple mm. of weeks ago, and he described the uh, the the level of Treasury yields as a kind of dirty float, uh, given the sort of mm. massive uh, QE programs uh, that have been implemented over the past couple of weeks. And I think that's a nice way of describing the kind of almost yield curve control uh, policies that a lot of central banks have been have been pursuing uh, recently um, i think that's a that's a nice response to end this discussion on i'm sorry if um we didn't address any of the questions specifically although i think we touched on most of the points that were raised by uh by by viewers in the chat box um, if you have any
if you have any extra questions that you uh, that you urgently want addressed, uh, please send them into the uh, inquiries mailbox, and we'll we'll endeavor to um, to discuss them as well offline. Um, and on that note, thank you very much, Gary and, and Jagjit, for uh, for participating. It was a, a fascinating presentation and, and discussion. Um, and uh, wishing you both a nice remainder of your week. And thank you to everyone for tuning in.